this lecture, we're talking about multivariable poles and zeros. This is part of our unit in which we discuss dynamic models in general, state-space models in particular, realizations, solutions of the state model, both in continuous time and discrete time, poles and zeros of a system, and next time we'll look at modal decomposition of state models. Poles and zeros of a system, and this may be either in continuous time or discrete time. In discrete time, we have this difference equation with this output equation. If we take the Z transform of this difference equation, we get this expression. And assuming zero initial conditions, here I have Z x of Z and A x of Z. I can take this over to the other side. I can factor out x of z. When I do, notice that x z here is multiplied by x of z, but I can insert an identity matrix in the middle here. Remember, the identity matrix acts like a 1 in terms of matrix multiplications. So I, I get z i minus a times x of z is equal to b u of z. I can solve for x of z and get this expression. I multiply on the left by the inverse of z i minus a. Taking this expression now, I can plug it into the z transform of this expression and factor out u of z, and what I get is the transfer function. In this case, it's a transfer function matrix, so oftentimes we'll see the transfer function as y of z over u of z if we have a single input, single output system, but in, in the case when you have a multi-input, multi-output system, you will get a transfer function matrix. So this is what we have in discrete time. In, dis in continuous time, we basically have the same thing. We have this dif differential equation, an output equation. We take the Laplace transform of the differential equation. And again, assuming zero initial condition, this term goes away. I take a x of s over to the other side. I can factor out x of s and, and get this expression for x of s. This expression I plug into the Laplace transform of this equation, and I get this expression for the transfer function in, in continuous time. So in both continuous time and discrete time, we basically have a similar form for our transfer function. It's d plus c, uh, si minus a, or zi minus a inverse b. Now if we look at si minus a inverse, that's equal to the adjugate of si minus a divided by the determinant of si minus a. And the determinant of si minus a is a scalar, so I can take that outside of this multiplication. And putting all of this over a common denominator, I have this expression. This expression shows a matrix polynomial, so the adjugate of si minus a is a polynomial in S. I get a polynomial matrix in the numerator and a scalar in the denominator. This is a, the determinant is a scalar. It'll be a polynomial. In fact, it'll be the characteristic polynomial. And so this is this is what the transfer function will look like. It'll be similar in discrete time, only we'll have z's instead of s's. Now suppose we have a system and we apply a particular kind of input to that system. So here, in this case, I'm considering a single input, single output system. And I'm going to apply this input, which is basically, this is it, the same signal in, in the time domain. It's an, it's an exponential function. If I apply this system, or this signal, to this system, I will get an output that looks like this. This is the form of the output. That is, I will have a term that involves the same exponential as the input, and then I'll have another term over here that will come out. It's related to the dynamics of the system. But the important thing is, I apply an input with this, um, of this function, and I get an output that has that function as part of the output. Okay, so that's what the eigenfunction does. And, and A here could be either a real number, a complex number, or purely imaginary number, any of those cases. So that's the eigenfunction of a system. I apply an input, of a certain form into a system, I get the output having this uh, term with that same form. Well, what, what does a zero of a, of a system do? Well, suppose I have a system like this, and I apply this input to the system. 
In this case, the the a is not the is not the uh, the pole value. It's actually just a scalar. Applying this input now to my system, taking the inverse Laplace transform, I get this expression. And notice I do not have e to the minus two coming out of the of the overall expression. So the question is, what happened to the eigenfunction? I applied an eigenfunction to the system. I got an output, but my output did not have the eigenfunction as part of the output. Well, when you take the Laplace transform of this, you'll get a over s plus 2. And when I multiply by this, which is basically, remember, a product in the s domain is a convolution in the time domain. So we're actually doing a convolution here in a sneaky way. That is, we're doing it all algebraically as opposed to um, using calculus. So when I multiply by a over s plus 2, the s plus 2 terms cancel. And so when I take the partial fraction expansion of the remainder, um, I will get two terms, one involving s plus 3, one involving s plus 4. Taking the inverse Laplace transform, I get this expression. And notice the s plus 2 term does not appear because it canceled. Okay, It canceled. And because of that cancellation, um, that's what happened to the eigenfunction. The, the 0 canceled that function. So I can think of a 0 of a system as being like a um, as being like a notch filter, so a filter with a frequency response that has a notch in it. If you try to apply, if you have a notch and you try to apply an input at that notch, then you will, you will not get anything coming through of that frequency. Okay, and and so that's that's basically what's happening here, where the the zero is notching out the input that we've applied. Okay, so that's what happens, that's what zeros do when you have them in a system. So this is a single input, single output system. What about a multi-input, multi-output system? So here's a multi-input, multi-output system, and I have two different inputs that I'm going to apply. I apply this input to the system, and when I look at the output, this is the output that I get. So if I take the Laplace transform of this signal, I will get 1 over s plus 1, and notice that cancels with the s plus 1 here. And so when we take the inverse Laplace transform, I just get 1 over s squared. And the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s squared is just t. Um, and so that's what I get. And when I multiply this times this, I'm going to get 0 down here anyway. So when I, so, but notice the, um, the eigenfunction did not come through, okay? Again, because it canceled. Similarly, I have this function that I apply, and when I apply it to the system, this is the output I get. And again, the eigenfunction does not come through. So what happens to the eigenfunctions? They get canceled along the way. And so even though I have an output, it's not related to the eigenfunction. It's related to the system poles, not the eigenfunction poles. So a key point here is that I can have not only an eigenfunction uh, associated with the system, but I can also have a um, direction. My zero not only has a value, in this case, s plus 2, uh, s plus uh, s is equal to minus 1, that is when, it, when s is equal to minus 1, this is 0. I not only have a value for, for my 0, but I have a direction. Okay, so this vector, as a vector, provides the direction associated with the zero. Similarly, here I have not only a value, s is equal to minus 2, but I also have a direction. Okay, that's a vector of this form. So, I know, so that's important to realize that when you are working with a, a multivariable zero, you have not only a value of the zero, but a direction. Now, for a, a scalar function, we can define poles as the value of s that make the function go to infinity. And basically, that will be the roots of the denominator d of s. Okay. Um, in general, a, a causal transfer function will, have, will be strictly proper. That means the relative degree of the transfer function is greater than or equal to zero. 
So the relative degree of a transfer function is equal to the degree of the denominator minus the degree of the numerator. So with the relative degree then, uh, if the relative degree of n is less than or equal to the relative degree of d, I'm sorry, the degree of d, then the relative degree is non-negative. So for a causal system, the relative degree will always be a non-negative number. If the relative degree is a positive number, that is, the degree of the denominator is greater than the degree of the numerator, then that system is said to be strictly proper, in which case, I actually, if I, if I let s go to infinity, the denominator has a higher power of s than the, than the numerator, and so as s goes to infinity, this f as a function will go to zero. That means I have a zero at infinity. So zeros are the values of s that make h of s go to zero. I can have what are called finite zeros or infinite zeros. Finite zeros are going to be the roots of n of s. The infinite zeros are the zeros that are, that are left over. That is, n of s and d of s have the same number, uh, that is, a rational function will have the same number of poles as zeros, or z same number of zeros as poles. So if the relative degree is positive, then I will have that many, the relative degree is the number of zeros at infinity. Okay, otherwise we will have the rest of the zeros at the roots of n of s. So this is what happens for a scalar function. For a polynomial, or rather a rational matrix function, um, I, I have a similar kind of thing. Notice that in this case, if s is equal to minus 2, this term will go to 0, but this term will also go to 0. So notice in this particular case, I can have something that is both, that is both a pole and a 0 at the same location. So remember that the, the, when I say same location, I mean same value of s. But remember, a 0 has not only a value, but also a direction. And similarly, a pole can have not only a value, but also a direction. So in multivariable cases, a pole location, a, the, a transfer function has a pole at frequency p if any element has a pole at s is equal to p. A zero location, s has a zero at frequency z if, and there are three different kinds of zero locations for a multivariable system. There's a transmission zero, a blocking zero, and an invariant zero. So what are all these zeros all about? Okay, transmission zero. Basically, the system will have, uh, so lambda is a transmission zero of the function if and only if there exists a non-zero vector v such that h evaluated lambda times v is equal to zero and there is a non-zero vector w such that w times h evaluated lambda is also equal to zero. Okay, so that is the definition of a transmission zero. So the transmission zero is based on the transfer function. Similarly, a blocking zero, h, uh, the value lambda is a blocking zero if and only if this quantity is equal to zero. Now what is this quantity? This quantity is, is the numerator of the transfer function matrix. Another way of looking at a blocking zero, lambda is a blocking zero of h of s if when I plug lambda in I get all zeros, the whole, a whole matrix of zeros. Okay? This is very rare, but this, it has a name. It's called the blocking zero. The third kind of zero we're going to look at here is called an invariant zero. An invariant zero is a value lambda such that uh, if and only if, if there exists non -zero, a non-zero vector that includes x and u such that a minus lambda i, b, c, and d times this vector is equal to zero. So if there is such a non-zero vector, notice that I could have z x equals zero and u not zero, or I could have 
x non-zero and u equal to zero. But is but what this says is that this entire vector is not zero. There is something that's not zero in this entire vector. And it, you might have both x and u non-zero. But when I'm I have a non-zero vector here such that this product is zero. Or another way of saying it is this matrix has a non-trivial right null space. We've talked about null space already, but I, I, here I specify right null space in, in that I'm actually looking at vectors that multiply this matrix on the right. Similarly, this same matrix will also have a non-trivial left null space. That is, there exi exist uh, non-zero y and v such that this vector times zero uh, times this quantity is zero. A non-zero thing times this matrix giving zero. Okay, so that's an invariant zero has that property. There are both the, the right and the left null spaces that, that are a part of the, the definition of an invariant zero. So here we explicitly see direction just as we saw a direction in the transmission zero. The transmission zero also had a, a non-zero vector uh, that was working with it. So these are the definitions of multivariable poles and zeros.